Berlin and the wider group that's involved at the Open University for, um, for inviting me today. Um, what I'm going to say today comes from my recent book, which is up there. Uh, the Postcolonial Subject, Claiming Politics, Governing Others in Late Modernity. Um, there were two impetuses for this particular book. One was the invasion and occupation of Iraq uh, in the name of various things, as we were told by the Bush administration and the Blair administration. Uh, these two were purportedly enacting what Blair referred to as a kind of liberal internationalism. And Iraq came to be one of, uh, if you like, a manifestation of what Blair defined as liberal internationalism. So um, he saw a continuity between Kosovo and Iraq. Um, so that was one impetus for the book. The other impetus was the Arab Spring. The latter impetus, I've argued, was actually a response. So the Arab Spring, I have interpreted as being a response to the forms of intervention that have taken place, primarily in the post-colonial world, um, my areas of interest are the Middle East and South Asia. Uh, I've travelled extensively, uh, especially through the Middle East, talked to people about both the pre-Arab Spring moment and the Arab Spring itself, um, and have come up with various conclusions that I hoping I'll share with you today. So, in relation to the first drive or impetus that made me want to write this book, I've previously written about intervention, um, what I refer to as liberal cosmopolitan interventions in other people's societies. In these interventions, war actually plays a very significant role. So that in late modernity, war is no longer seen as a, if you like, in the Clausewitzian sense of the continuation of policy through other means, but is rather seen as a technology of government. So war is about governing other societies. And so this is why you have in locations of war, <coughs> Iraq, Afghanistan, Kosovo too, and other locations previously to that Sierra Leone. War locations have also become locations of governing. And so those who intervene are not engaged in the defeat of a precise enemy, but rather are engaged in using both military and civilian technologies in the government of populations. And so this, it seems to me, would also involve uh, practices that the United Nations and many, many academics would refer to as peace building. So you can see in these discourses and practices the, dis the disappearance of distinctions, the disappearance of the distinction between war and peace, the disappearance of the distinction between war and security, and war and policing, the political and the social, the political and the ethical, and so on and so on. So these practices, as well as discourses, are now deeply institutionalized in our international institutions. They're also deeply institutionalized in the various national institutions within especially the NATO alliance. 
So all of these discourses and practices I refer to as a form of liberal cosmopolitanism. Because the primary enactment here is that war is taking place in the name of the human. And the notion of human rights is often invoked in these various uh, locations. The other, if you like, distinction that disappears in these practices is that between war and pedagogy, war becomes a pedagogical exercise. In most of these locations, in... can I have a mic, please? Oh, that's fine. It's back. Yeah, okay. <coughs> what do you find in most of these locations? and uh, Iraq and Afghanistan are primary examples here, though the Balkans are also a very good example. You find practices that are referred to as training. So the training of local police forces, the training of uh, personnel within the military, and so on and so on. And so war becomes a pedagogical exercise as well. And as we know from Michel Foucault, power has this way of uh, permeating the social through pedagogical exercises, through what he refers to as pastoral exercises, um, as well as the more coercive, the more uh, military, and so on and so on. So the question then emerges, what happens to political subjectivity when these interventions are, do, are so deeply materialized. They're materialized not just through, you know, aerial bombardments, through the use of drones and so on. As I've just described, they're materialized in the everyday and the routine of the lives of populations, primarily in the post-colonial world. So what happens to political subjectivity in these locations of intervention? So I come to the second impetus to the writing of this book, which is exactly this question. What's happened to the post-colonial subject? When I started writing this book, uh, a panel was set up at ISA, that's the International Studies Association Northeast section, to sort of read one or two chapters from the book. And one of the challenges that the, uh, that the panel set was, well, how can you talk about the singular post-colonial subject when there is such diversity? My response to that is the following. We talk about the European subject, but we always assume diversity and a kind of empirical domain that is the post-colonial world. Why can we not somehow capture some idea of what the post-colonial subject might suggest? What does it mean for us to talk about the post-colonial it seems to me that the post-colonial, specifically the post prefix post in the post-colonial, has tremendous meaning for us. Because the post and the post-colonial, there are some people in this room who would disagree with me, there are, the, the post and the post-colonial is for me a moment of founding. It's a moment of founding of the post-colonial subject as political subject. And it's a moment of founding of political community. The tremendous challenge for me in this book was to locate that moment of founding. Is it simply formal independence? You know, the anti-colonial struggles which led to the withdrawal of the British from India, the British from Iraq, the British from uh, Egypt, and so on and so on. 
south of the island of founding. I want to argue against that notion, though I want to hold on to this idea of the significance, the meaningfulness, if you like, the weight of history that's contained in this short prefix, the post in the post-colonial. So how do we find this moment of founding, to use a, an, Arendtian, uh, an Arendtian construct? How does that political community come about? If we start, oops, if we start from the Arab Spring, how do we interpret this monumental moment in the Middle East and Middle Eastern post-colonial politics? Can we suggest that the Arab Spring is a moment of founding of political community so that the lost promise of independence is somehow retrieved what was lost throughout those period, throughout those years of formal independence, <coughs> now being retrieved in the squares and on the streets of the Middle East, can we think of the Arab Spring as such a moment of founding, as a kind of anti-colonial struggle located within our late modern context? This is a context, as I've just described, of intervention of the deep permeation of the colonial order into the lived experience of the post-colonial world. So that the Arab Spring was not simply about the, was the uh, defeat of the Mubaraks uh, or of the Alis of the, of the Middle East, but rather it was a direct response to the sustenance of these regimes, first of all, but I would say even more significantly than that, the wars that have taken place in that region in the form of intervention and in what is purportedly referred to as wars in the name of the human. So, as I argued earlier, there's a material presence of a late modern colonial order in the everyday and the routine of Middle Eastern societies primarily. And these have come in the form of violence, they have come in the form of incarceration, they have come in the form of uh, secret locations of torture, and so on and so on. Everyone, every individual in the Middle East and beyond the Middle Eastern diasporas across the world, the Arab diasporas of all the religions, are aware of this and reflect upon these practices and what these practices have done to that region. And this awareness and this reflexivity has had a feedback, if you like, in constituting the, an emergent political subject in that, in that region. So that when we refer to the Arab Spring or the Arab Awakening, we might suggest that this late modern awakening is a response to the persistent presence of the colonial structure and the colonial order in the everyday and the routine of the citizen and the populations of that, of that region. I have five minutes, so I'll shut up in five minutes. Now, I also want to argue against those who suggest that somehow the Arab Spring is a new thing. It's not a new thing. The practices of war, the liberal cosmopolitanism of late modern warfare that I described earlier, I argue are continuities of the past colonial order. So you can see practices of governmentality, to use a Foucauldian term, during the colonial order. And you can see the violence during 
the colonial order. And you can see the continuities into the present. So that if you go to military academies in the US, here in the UK, you see the generals and their cronies reading past manuals on counterinsurgency. This is well documented and well recorded, so I'm not saying anything that's original here. However, there's a, an interesting continuity in relation to resistance. The resistances, the moments of resistance that took place when the British, especially I'm talking about the British today, I could be talking about the French tomorrow, but let me stick to the British. We are in Britain. Uh, and most of us in this room, I'm guessing, are post-colonial subjects. Uh, so let's stick to the, to the British for the time being. I argue in the book that, uh, that the colonists, the colonials, just simply refuse to leave. They want to remain in place. Even when they have withdrawn, they want to remain in place. And that remaining in place is not just discursive, as I've already suggested, it's a material presence in the spaces, in the material spaces of the colonized, and, and in the material spaces of the post-colonial. The colonial power also has a persistent presence in the embodied subjectivity of the post-colonial subject. So that whenever the uh, individual is tortured, whenever the individual is seen as the racial carrier of a population that's deemed to be, uh, that's deemed to be um, uh, unworthy of recording when deaths occur during wartime and so on. The colonial power refuses to simply leave. We can see this during the colonial era. Egypt declared independence in 1922. They had a revolution in 1919. A revolution, if you see the, um, the archives on, on Egypt's 1919 revolution. It's very reminiscent of the practices that took place in Tahrir Square. They had a revolution, and that challenge for me, conceptually, of locating the moment of founding of political community. 1919 could be seen as such a moment of founding for Egypt as political community. However, the British persist in their presence in Egypt, in its material spaces, in its embodied subjectivities. They remain. They also remain by 1922, when the Egyptians are constituting political community, exactly through deliberation over what goes into their constitution into that material presence of political community, namely the declaration of independence and the founding of political community textualized in 1922, but the British remain in place. And they remain in place until Nasser's revolution. And so, do I refer to Nasser's revolution as that moment of founding of political community for Egypt? Nasser gets a, gets a lot of coverage in my book, for good reason. But there is a persistence of the colonial order, it continues to the present day. This is why we had, and continue to have, the Arab Spring. Thank you.